Hello, this is National Master Jeremy Kane with Chess.com, bringing you a game of the day covering yesterday's amazing game at the Chess 24 Legends of Chess tournament between Vassal Ivanchuk with the white pieces and Peter Laco with the black pieces. And heading into this game, Laco led by one point with only one game left in the match. So this was a must win for Ivanchuk against a very solid opponent. And let's see what he did when he absolutely had to win the game. He played e4, e5, and f4. The King's Gambit. One of my personal favorite openings. One I played a lot when I was a kid. And one that most players give up when they get to a certain level. Especially at the top, because the King's Gambit is a very risky opening. White is exposing the King and sacrificing a pawn right on move two. This was a popular way to play 200 years ago. Paul Morphy liked to play it sometimes. It's a very rare guest at top-level tournaments. But Ivanchuk needed a win, and it is a great way to mix things up and get an exciting game. Now, previously, and the one other time that I know of that Ivanchuk played a King's Gambit, he tried Bishop C4, but he goes full old-school style and plays the old main line Knight to F3. And now black has lots of options. The uh, calmest move that many players play trying to just get a simple game is d5, fighting back in the center. But credit to Lenko, he wants to play for a win too. And he goes for a method that's attempting to hold on to this extra pawn on f4. The old main move was g5, which is still played today. It's still quite popular. But after h4, g4, Knight to e5, it gets some wild positions. There was a very famous game between world champions Spassky and Fischer. Fischer wrote about it in his My 60 Memorable Games, where he got a winning position as black and then ended up losing, and Spassky won in, out of this position. And that game prompted Fischer to come up with other ways to try to keep that extra pawn but avoid that specific g5 h4 maneuver. And so Fischer decided that d6 was a full refutation of the King's Gambit. Ivanchuk apparently disagrees, as does, I guess, Laco, because Laco tries to set up g5 another way with h6. My favorite move here is sort of a wild one, just playing b3. It looks like it's out of left field, but you can play bishop b2 and really target that black rook if black ever plays g5. But Ivanchuk wants a little more of a logical game and plays d4. Just dominates the center. g5, black keeps his extra pawn. And in the old days, most people would have probably played knight to c3 here. But Ivanchuk immediately turns this into a pure gambit with no hope of getting his, extra, his lost pawn back. He just trades it off to open an h-file for his rook and potentially the f-file if he wants to go after the f7 pawn. The downside is it's a pure gambit. Black is up a pawn and not about to give it back anytime soon. Leiko develops and Ivanchuk develops. And here, uh, many players have played a move like bishop c4 before, but Ivanchuk tries a strategy that works very well here and was a favorite of Kasparov when he had a must-win position. When you need to win a game, often instead of creating immediate, super complicated tactics, the best thing to do is keep the tension. Play calmly, develop your pieces to the center, and wait for the right moment to strike after the tension is built up and your opponent can't take it anymore. So Ivanchuk's going to play a lot of very calm moves, even though he's in a must-win situation. And he just plays bishop e3. He just wants to develop, guard his center, and prepare to castle queenside. Laco is happy to develop as well, and both sides get ready to castle. Knight g4 attacks the bishop, and Ivanchuk is not going to want to give up the bishop pair, and in particular, keep an eye on this dark square bishop. This is going to be the star of the game. So let's save it. Bishop back to g1. Laco keeps developing. White's going to castle. Black castles. And a good sign for someone in a must-win situation, 
We're castled on opposite sides. There's a very good chance we're going to get an exciting game. Even if White's not necessarily winning in this position, he's at least going to get some chances. And he tries here to start an immediate attack. He goes knight to h2, wants to trade off a defender, and prepare to double rooks on the h-file and expose black's king. I do wonder what he had in mind after the column knight f6. I don't think objectively white has quite enough compensation here, but it is a very complicated position with plenty of chances for black to go wrong. In the actual game, Lako captured, and Ivanchuk calmly captures back. After bishop g4, there's nothing really wrong with bishop e2, but if we want to keep the game complicated, let's allow more pieces to stay on the board with rook e1. Lego plays knight to e7, uh, freeing his c-pawn to go to either c6 or c5, and bringing the knight over towards guarding his own king. Again, very calm play by Ivanchuk. There's no need for bishop c4, where the bishop looks aggressive, but it might also get attacked by a later b5. Let's just fee in shadow and control the center. Queen d7. Let's control the center with the other bishop as well and start targeting that black king side. And here, I think the best move is to put, honestly, either rook for black on e8. Lako played the very natural looking knight g6, which helps guard the king side, but unfortunately doesn't have a lot to do on g6. Notice h4, f4, e5 are all well protected by white. The knight ends up being a little passive on the g6 square. Ivanchuk just keeps improving his pieces with rook h1. And after c6, we get a critical moment. I recommend pause your video and figure out what would you play here. Did you come up with the brilliant rook takes h6? Because that's what Ivanchuk played. He's sacrificing an exchange, although he does pick up two pawns. So now white has one pawn for the exchange. So black is ahead, but the black king is going to be exposed for the entire rest of the game. And white has that bishop pair. And particularly the unopposed g5 bishop is going to be a big deal going forward. Lako kicks the bishop back, and it's happy to retreat. And after rook h8, remember, Ivanchuk's in no hurry. He's going to increase the tension and just keep playing calm good moves. He trusts in his compensation for the exchange. Even though his king is safer than black's king, he still might have some back rank problems once he loses his rook. So he's just going to play b3 and get ready to hide that king on b2. Lako trades rooks and hides the king on h7. And even though I say hide and white doesn't have any rooks to attack on the open h file, it's still not super safe. And Ivanchuk's going to figure out how to get this g2 bishop involved in an attack on the black king. He plays the excellent bishop f1, repositioning the piece so it can target h7. After bishop h3, of course, we're not going to trade. And actually, Ivanchuk plays a little bit of a mysterious move. I would normally expect bishop d3 here, getting ready to target the black king. He pauses with bishop e2. And my guess is he's thinking, if bishop g4, then bishop d3, and we've cleared the h-file, and we've prevented black's queen from coming to g4. Since Lako didn't play bishop g4, it's hard to say exactly what Ivanchuk was thinking. Bishop e2. Lako plays rook e8 instead. And again, let's stay calm. Black has no big threats. Get the king even safer. No one's coming close to checking that king. It's a big contrast with the black king, which has no pawn shelter and it's wide open on h7. b5, trying some sort of attack, but white's king's very safe. And again, that e2 bishop wants to target the black king. Let's get over there. I know there's a pawn and a knight in the way, but this is going to happen at some point. Let's keep an eye on it. Lego plays queen g4, which isn't a blunder, but does feel a little exposed. And if Ivanchuk was going for a more aggressive mood, he could have played the immediate e5 to try to demonstrate the problems with the queen. 
After f5, the game is maybe slightly better for white, but still incredibly complicated. Um, if black captures the pawn, that really lets you demonstrate how the queen on g4 is misplaced. White would play knight e4, and if it can ever get to f6, it's threatening a monster family fork of the king and the queen and the rook. And even if black defends with a move like rook e6, we still win material. Knight g5 check, king takes the bishop, but knight takes rook, and white has a big advantage. But again, Ivan checks in no hurry this whole game. Back to our position after queen to g4, he just retreats his bishop to a safer square on e3. b4 hits the knight, but the knight can just retreat. It's going to come back out later on f2 or e3. And... Black takes the g3 pawn. Why not? Uh, white doesn't want to just lose material for free, so he captures on b4, and just as importantly, activates his queen. We're hitting d6, and we're threatening an important check on b7. Lego plays bishop g4, attacking the knight, and also threatening to remove the defender of the bishop on e3. Black is about to win more material. Remember, he's already ahead, but... White has a much safer king, and he's ready for these tactics. Again, I recommend pause your video and figure out what would you play if you had white here? Did you come up with e5? That's an excellent move by Ivanchuk. He's been saving it for a while now. He's pinning the knight. He's attacking a couple pawns. And let's see what happens if black gets greedy and takes the knight on d1. Ivanchuk had this prepared. He was probably going to play queen b7 check. He's not worried about the rook blocking. We can just capture it, and this knight is pinned. That's a free rook. So backing up, the king has to move. If he goes to g8, pawn takes pawn, threatens mate, also threatens pawn f7 check, hitting the rook and the king. Which means king h8 is forced. And now queen takes pawn, again hits the rook, and once the rook moves, we get the deadly queen h1 fork. If the king moves, we have a check on h6, and if the queen blocks the check, we win our piece back on d1 with an excellent, I would say, winning position for white. With all that calculated, Leiko wants to avoid the worst of it and plays f5. There are a couple of good moves for white here, but Ivanchuk just takes a safe option. Queen takes pawn. Actually giving away the knight on d1 for just one more pawn. And we've reached an amazing position. White has only three pawns for a whole rook. This is an extra rook for black here on e8. And despite all that, white's already winning. First, we have a simple tactic. If queen takes bishop... Queen takes knight check, and mate in the corner. But even after better moves, this pin and the very exposed black king mean that black's in big trouble. He tries rook g8 to defend his knight. And again, absolutely no rush, keeping the tension. Amazing play by Ivanchuk. He just says, I don't care about the material that I'm behind. I just need to save my bishops that it's in danger. So he just calmly retreats it to d2. And after bishop g4, there's an impressive little tactic that's going to win material in the game for white. But even if black had tried something else, it wouldn't fundamentally change the position. His king is always going to be unsafe, and white should have a way to win against any option. Take a moment and figure out what would you play for white here. Ivanchuk tried queen e7 check, and once the check was blocked, he plays queen g5, and we get an amazing lineup here on the g-file. Five pieces in a row, and two of them are pinned, the knight and the bishop. That means white is going to win material. There's no good defense for black. He moves his queen out of the pin, and white just captures a piece. Now he has... Three pawns for an exchange, which is actually a material advantage. 
And there's no need to keep attacking the Black King here. Ivanchuk's just going to meticulously trade his way into a winning endgame. First, let's trade queens. Fork, force the queens off the board. His bishop's in danger on d2, so he makes a threat. And then, instead of moving this bishop, let's force another trade. Bishop back to f3. And three pawns for the exchange is going to win the game in the endgame. Notice our last piece left is that bishop that we've saved a couple times from exchanges. And it's not done yet. So he attacks the a-pawn and starts running those pawns on the queen side. Even though this might look like a calm position, we've got one more tactic to get to. Black's king has come and is going to catch the b-pawn, but it's defended. And we're ready to play c4 and get three passed pawns. King to c6, c4. And Ivanchuk's going to run those pawns as far as they go. Notice the great teamwork of these white pieces. The king guards the bishop, which guards two pawns. Actually, guards, sorry, guards three pawns. The bishop's also guarded by a pawn. Black's king and rook are essentially helpless. He tries king d7. And white has more than one winning move. But this is actually a great position to take a moment and pause and figure out how would you win with white? What's the fastest way to force through a promotion? Ivanchuk finds one more great tactic. B7, trying to promote and forcing king c7. And then one last sacrifice. We only have one piece left. Let's sacrifice it. Beautiful move, bishop d6. If king takes bishop, we promote the b-pawn. So king takes pawn. And now bishop to e5, cuts off the rook's defense. There's no way to stop this pawn from turning into a queen. And Laco resigned. Strangely enough, Laco recovered effectively and actually won the Armageddon game after this to win their match. But I think when this tournament's all over, regardless of who wins the tournament, this was the game of the event. An amazing King's Gambit at the highest level is still playable today. This was National Master Jeremy Kane with Chess.com.